exhibition of I Conduct, Therefore I Am, as well as this fabulous talk event with um, our PhD candidate Nikki Guru and together with uh, the illustrator Maggie McMahon. So events like these are really important, particularly um, the library holds these events each semester to uh, promote the research, the diverse research of the Sydney Conservatory and Music Library. So events like these enable greater engagement with uh, interested researchers as well as um, invited enthusiasts to get involved in the discussion, the online discussion. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the Conservatorium's Dean Professor Anna Reid will come and give acknowledgement country and followed by the uh, moderator associate dean for research and education, Dr. K uh, Chris Cody, um, who will introduce our speakers to you. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, for the warm welcome. Thank you, everybody up in the cafe, for um, lowering your volume just a little bit. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody here to the Sydney Conservatorium of Music for millennia. This has been a site where knowledge has been promulgated through song and through dance uh, and through the way that people comport themselves uh, in their dress. So the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation were the first uh, Indigenous scholars to enable Europeans to understand what that culture was about. And so it's a special privilege for me to welcome you to the Conservatory because we're on that exact same spot. Um, we're on the spot where knowledge has always been about exchange and understanding. We're at the spot that music has been central to that understanding. So my um, deep thanks and acknowledgement go to Elders past, present and emerging. I particularly like emerging because that's our current scholars here at the Conservatory who are taking their place um, in the 21st century knowledge-based world. I have had the delight of working with Nikki since I think you were an undergraduate, but definitely doing your masters. Um, and she used to play baroque flute. That's how I first got to know her because I'm also a hipster like she is. So it's been my absolute pleasure watching her develop and grow both as a musician and a scholar to see where she's finally come to come to today. And for this particular exhibition, which is her collaborations with another artist to bring forth the deep knowledge that she has discovered through her studies. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague Chris, um, who will tell you even more about these amazing young scholars coming by. Welcome everybody. Um, I'd also like to begin by um, acknowledging that we are meeting today on unceded Gadigal land and paying my respects to traditional owners, past, present, emerging, and to all First Nations people here today. Um, I would also, I, I suppose, like to, to declare a special interest in today's forum. Um, for those of you that don't know, Nikki is literally hours away from submitting her PhD thesis. Um, so time is precious, and we're going to try to make the most of this conversation um, so that Nikki can get back to formatting uh, her documents. Um, Nikki is an accomplished author. Um, she's the author of a memoir titled The Universal Language. Um, she's the author of uh, the children's books Goodbye, Moment, and The Year of the Dragon. And Nikki and Maggie McMahon have collaborated on two additional children's books, The Frog Prince and A Miracle in My Pocket. Um, Maggie is a Queensland-based illustrator and visual artist who seeks to 
um, quote, create art that empowers, engages, and plays with the hearts and minds of her audiences. And we're very excited to be here today to sort of interrogate a little bit about what that means and um, how that has manifested in her relationship and collaboration with Nikki. I'm going to begin um, by asking Nikki to walk us through the installation we'll experience after this talk and a little bit about how, um, how it came together and, um, and what it seeks to convey. Okay, so the, so the exhibition um, emerged out of um, it's an interesting thing to say. So the research I'm doing in my PhD looks at five workshops on conducting, when I went and watched how conductors are trained. And then at the end of those five workshops, I went and participated in a workshop that had nothing to do with conducting, but was actually about Shakespeare. And the idea of not learning Shakespeare to perform, but this idea of embodying, so somehow getting it into your body and yourself. And I found that that experience was just so formative. And from that experience, I drew these five themes, which were text, breath, bodies, space, and unity. And I really felt that those five themes needed to somehow be, even if they weren't like sort of chapter headings in my thesis, they had to be threads that ran through the thesis in some way. Because I've always felt that conducting, similarly, is based on a text, a beautiful score, which is then conducted by someone's body, and that the mediation of that text and body is, is breath. I mean, it's so important to breathe for musicians and breathe to keep the phrase. And that then a conductor is not just, are they you know, conducting it statically, but they're conducting in space and conveying space and making space between themselves and the orchestra. And then that is what achieves unity. So those are the five things that work through my work. And when I was talking to Chris about this, I was saying, you know, these are, these are ideas that we all sort of know, but they're really hard to capture sort of in words. And so I thought, well, what's better than words is pictures. And yes, having collaborated with Maggie on children's books and really enjoying the way she creates these sort of worlds, I said to Maggie, do you want to create five pictures that capture these themes? And we're going to pair them with one of the historical figures in my thesis. So the historical figures in my thesis are Descartes, so the person who said, I think, therefore I am, which is where the title of this exhibition comes from, I conduct, therefore I am. His counterpart, Spinoza, which is what my work's really actually about, and Mendelssohn and Wagner, who are then the other sort of counterpoints, in that they had very different conducting styles. Mendelssohn was very gentle and led from sort of the music was where he made his ideas. Whereas Wagner was much more sort of charismatic, sort of demonic sometimes even, and really believed that he had to come up with a narrative or a story to overlay on the music to then have the idea that he wanted to convey to the orchestra. So again, there are the sort of counterpoint. And in the middle, this idea of breath, and also I suppose challenging the idea of when the mind and body got separated, I have this figure that is the figure of Adam from the Bible, but Maggie and I worked really hard to remove gender from the creation of Adam, because in the Hebrew original in the Bible, Adam is created without gender. It's this idea that there's this, this human that's formed, and actually only that when Eve is cleaved is man and woman formed. So it's something we work really hard, and I think Maggie can talk more to that. Thanks. And Maggie, do you maybe want to grab that mic, and then you can both can share that mic, and I can. Um, yeah. um, so maybe Maggie, we can turn to you, and um, and can you tell us a little bit about what it uh, first of all. How much about Descartes and Spinoza did you know before going into this project? And then how were you able to create these visual worlds you know, in relation to the ideas that he was posing? Well, uh, I didn't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> My knowledge about the music world is fairly limited, but you know, as a creative, I respect and appreciate it. It's very complicated, and there's lots of layers and lots of important figures historically in theology and that sort of thing. So I did a lot of research. Um, <laughs> Uh, when this all started. I've also never illustrated a PhD before, so that was an entirely new area for me, but uh, it was a great challenge and I enjoyed it. Um, sorry, what was the second question? Well, I'm wondering about the, um, you know, your approach to creating visual worlds, which I think he was so taken with. Yes, well, my creative process, it starts pretty raw. Um, I usually get the brief um, from, this, from Nikki in this instance. Uh, she sent me an excerpt of her PhD, I read through it, she told me some ideas she had, and I basically, it's like a purge. So I just, I just expel all these random ideas that kind of relate to how I see these things, and then from there we refine it, and I always try to create like just a moment, a story, something that you can see unfolding. Um, I guess that's the narrative that 
because I, I illustrate books, I'm always sort of working within a narrative. So I try to create moments that you might not see in the words, in the images. Um, yeah, does that answer? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's always a work in progress though, like even now I look back at other things I think, oh I could have tweaked that and done that differently and it would have created a more expansive experience, but you know, it's yeah. all learning. <laughs> oh, thanks for that, Maggie. And, and maybe we can um, kind of uh, pursue a little bit of a narrative here on stage a bit and strip things back. Um, for people that aren't um, familiar with um, Cartesian thought and, um, and the Spinoza modest philosophy, what do you think, the, can you describe it in sort of uh, the easiest possible way with, um, you know, and, and how those two things are different? Sure, so the principle of Cartesianism is that he wanted to understand the way, or where, where do we put the mind? And the mind, to use the word mind is already a very important thing because Descartes was trying to move things in a scientific direction. Pre-Descartes, they used the word soul. So it was very much the soul and the body and the relationship between the two. And the soul, the idea of the soul being immaterial and survives beyond death, and the body being material and it doesn't. And for different reasons, the body had been, I suppose, quite condemned in a lot of the thinking. And so there was a sort of idea that the body was quite inferior to the mind. But Descartes was trying to work out where, where to sort of reconcile this. And so he tried to bridge the mind and body by putting the soul in a very specific part of the brain. And he chose the pineal gland because it's singular, like it's not in both spheres. So he's like, there it goes. So you can see that this was his attempt to understand that, as a scientist, there's definitely communication going on between the mind and body. To consider them as truly distinct didn't quite make sense. But as I said, he was very, um, one doesn't know if he was devout or more also just scared of the Catholic Church. And he wasn't prepared to really just say, okay, we're gonna say they're unified. We're gonna say that the body and the soul can both be material, they both can be unified. He wasn't prepared to like, say they could be the same thing. Spinoza comes along and they're you know, very, just a few decades between them, they did overlap in time, but never actually knew each other. Spinoza comes along and for various reasons in his own theology and then his own break from theology, basically decides he doesn't want to be trapped by the same theological superstitions. He wants to say, well, I just want to believe that there is only one thing, which I'm going to call the infinite, and we can call that God. And if there's only one infinite, then everything else has to only be a part of that infinite. So if the mind and body, to call them two things, we call that, there'd be two there's only a singularity, that's, that's not possible. I'm gonna say that there's just one substance in the entire world, and of that substance, it's just expressed in different modes. So it, the body, or sorry, the human, expresses itself as mind, and expresses itself as body, and yes, they work in different spheres, but they are essentially unified, you cannot separate them. So when you are a mind, you are always a body, and when you are a body, you are always a mind. But you have different functions, so it's this idea, and I like the image of a Mobius strip, they're the two sides of the paper, but by putting a twist and joining the ends, you can't ever separate them, you can't quite see where they separate out, but admittedly they were always two sides, and they had, as I say, they had distinct functionality and distinct contextual reference. And um, in your thesis, you talk a bit about um, some of the, I don't know if you would contextualize it, or, or you would frame it as problems, but maybe some of the issues that um, extend from thinking about the mind and body as being se separate substances. And I'm wondering if you can help the audience understand why, why is this idea that our minds and bodies are separate? Why, why, why does that throw up issues? How does it throw up issues? It throws up issues because it was the implication that they weren't just separate, but there was a hierarchy between them. That the mind was superior to the body. And what we see is we see those hierarchies play out and depending on how things got aligned, whether they got aligned with being more minded or more bodily, those hierarchies then were sort of inherited. We see that with gender. So women were associated more with the body and men more with the mind. And so then we have a sort of natural reason to tell women they shouldn't have certain professions, but men can. And we see these things recur. We see it in race theory. We see it in all sorts of different spaces. We see it with the sort of, where it stems from is this presumption that something is good and something is bad. And that's what Spinoza really challenged. So there's no such thing as a categorical good and a categorical bad. So we see it, as I say, recurring in lots of things. And in conducting, and the reason this all relates eventually to conducting, we see it in this idea that there are leaders and followers as distinct, as distinct categories. And again, not just are they distinct, but we reify this idea of a binary and a hierarchical binary. Leaders are superior, and we should all want to aspire to leadership, and followers are inferior, and somehow oppressed in their servitude of being followers, and therefore they, you know, we, we mustn't really think of them as Asianized people. And that is such an issue in conducting, and obviously something I really wanted to challenge is, I 
think a lot of us in this world don't want to believe that the conductor is there to boss around an orchestra. But for as long as that mentality persists, and as we call it in the thesis, is the dominant discourse in conducting pedagogy, we can't be surprised if that's how it gets enacted. We can't be surprised if even students today, people of my own age and training, still go and think they can just boss around an orchestra because someone's told them that if they're on the podium, they've got some claim to superiority to everyone else. Um, Maggie, I might ask you a, um, a cheeky question. We were just talking about um, uh, dissolving the boundaries between leaders and followers. Was there a leader and follower in this collaboration? <laughs> we're a team. Yeah. It's a team effort. <laughs> um, maybe, um, can, you, can you tell us, because you've collaborated a couple of times now, and so I'm interested in how that relationship has evolved and the things that um, perhaps you're able to do now as a collaborative team that were maybe difficult um, at first, the first project, or that have changed between projects you've worked on? Um, there hasn't, Nikki's been really easy to work with since the very first project, so there hasn't really been any need for, you know, like, like it's evolved in that we're more open and casual, I guess, um, but she's always been very approachable and open to discussion and negotiation and, you know, working out the details and, She's very patient, she's been patient the whole way through, which has been great. Um, yeah, so I guess in that way it has evolved that we're just more comfortable, more familiar, um, but the, the quality, I guess, has just increased. And the, um, is there a workshopping of ideas, like multiple drafts that you'll go through, and, and what, how do your drafts transform? Uh, well, like I said earlier, it starts out very raw. Um, I'll get a brief and then uh, I'll just, yeah, just put out a bunch of sketches, playing with all sorts of different ideas um, and send those off. And then Nikki will give me feedback on ideas she likes or what she doesn't like or the direction that I'm going and if I need to change it and then I'll redo those and then I'll redo them again. <laughs> and then I'll just basically flesh it out as much as possible um, so she's happy and I'm happy, um, but it's really, it's about making the client happy, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, we just flesh out the sketches and the rough phase for as much as we need to make sure it's good to go before I start final artwork, because you know, when you start the final, it's a lot harder to make big changes, so you want to get all that groundwork done really early on, yeah. Okay, and you can, yeah, maybe, yeah. No, because I like it, you know, I understand very much I work for clients as well, that you know, it's for the client. But I think why, you know, I work with three illustrators. And the reason I work with three illustrators is because I like to choose an illustrator who, from the beginning, I know is something that I think they'll, not, it's not to say they'll be good at, but there's something in their style that I feel is true to the thing I'm looking to explore, because I like it to be dialogic. So, um, so, yeah, so like with Maggie, the first book we did together was about a cheeky character. And I saw in one of her sketches a cheeky character. And I was like, this is someone who's going to capture cheekiness really well. And because I sort of, so we sort of start from a point of agreement, if that makes sense. Like, I know why I've asked Maggie in the first place. Then I can allow her to have so much freedom because I want to see what cheekiness she comes up with herself. I don't want to have to tell her. I mean, it's also not my personality. I'm not a cheeky person. So how would I direct <laughs> cheekiness? That would be disastrous. And so that's the sort of thing. And so it was in this project as well, when we were working together, it was... I know Maggie's really good at world building. So I said to her, like, that's what I want, Maggie. Like, I don't mind what world you build for me, but can you take your beautiful skills in world building and create this character so that, yes, these five themes aren't represented as five separate images, but are represented with the same character in five different ways. And so yeah, that's why I feel it's like a really wonderful way of working with someone because you know why you've asked them and you know what they're gonna bring to you that you could never do. If you paid me, you know, because if you gave me three years, I couldn't do what Maggie did in it, you know, ever, so. Um, well, let's talk about the idea of, um, of worlds, and, and particularly philosophical worlds. Um, so, um, you were talking about sort of um, initially the idea of challenging the um, binary between leaders and followers. Um, in a Spinozist world, um, is everybody subsumed into one thing, or are there leaders and followers? How would, you, how would you sort of explain that now that you're at the end of your thesis? Sure, so um, I'll quote someone. So there's a uh, scholar called Amy Cimini, who is one of the, um, there's no, not many people who apply Spinoza to music. And she does, and she specifically defines what she calls Spinoza's bodies. And she says that, that they are 
is it's a way of these things connecting, specifically so that they do not subsume or enter or pass through each other, but so that they become connected. And in becoming connected, become a richer and more complex unity or a constellation of bodies that then gain properties through their connection that they could never have had if they hadn't connected. But the whole point of them being this sort of idea of a constellation, which is why I like, it's a good word for it, is the individuality and independence is never seen. And so there's this idea of a perpetual sort of, that's why Spinoza is all about these paradoxes, because one is always an individual while they're part of a collective, a collective is always made up of individuals. So, so no, that's what's very exciting about it, is yes, of course there are leaders and followers. And that is what makes Spinoza, I'll say makes him misunderstood, because he's often interpreted as if he's saying we should work towards an ethic of really lovely care, and there's scholars who say, okay, so then we're just gonna have a, a quality where we sort of d dissolve the leaders, and we're not gonna have figureheads because figureheads are dangerous. But Spinoza didn't just write the ethics, which is the sort of most famous of his treatises. He wrote three treatises, and one of them is all about theology. And he talks about how Moses was the, in his eyes, archetypal leader. Because Moses was someone sort of put into the role, who didn't really have aspirations to, to be hierarchically important, but was able to gather and unify people in a way that couldn't have been achieved if a figurehead hadn't been there. So that's the way of answering the question. He very much permitted figureheads, as long as figureheads were again part of this collectivity where they recognize individuality and in moments, yes, may follow and in moments may lead and each individual in that collective may have those roles. But there's no need to dissolve the figurehead, which is why I find Spinoza useful in conducting thesis because I think the last thing conductors would have wanted me to do is say, no, work, that's it, no more conductors, we don't need them anymore. The aim is they're saying, yes, no, please, have someone there, just as you're gonna have an oboe player, and just as you're gonna have a double bass player, you're all still essentially required, but you're going to harness your individuality in the collectivity, and you're going to recognize that actually it's so much more, as I said, it's these effective properties that emerge, as, as Chinini says, by the connectivity, that you should be so enriched by and so enhanced by because there are possibilities that couldn't exist if not for your differences in the way that you've joined together. And I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, if we could think a little bit more about this, the boundaries of this collectivity. And right now I'm thinking about sitting in the audience um, during an orchestral performance, watching a conductor, listening to an orchestra. And I'm wondering if as a listener, I'm somehow part of this collectivity as well. If I have a position in there uh, as a follower or you know, as, as a consumer, am I a leader? You know, where are the boundaries here? How wide does this collectivity get when we're talking about music practice? Well, I would like to believe definitely that the, um, that the listeners are part of it because an orchestra wouldn't perform if not to be heard. So there has to be this whole idea of Spinner is about affect, of relationships, so affect with an A, the idea that one is affecting and affected at the same time, this idea of bi-directional affect. So I think, you know, why would an orchestra play, as in why would they want to affect an orchestra, if, in a Spinoza's world, well, if they didn't want to be affected by them, if they didn't want to, you know, be, you know, feel and uh, an sort of listeners' rapt attention, or in Spinoza's very dealing with life as it is, if they're not listening with rapt attention and there's reasons why they're not enjoying it, wanting to understand that affectivity too, to make modifications in themselves. So there's this idea that, you know, the whole world in Spinoza's eyes is, perpetual constellation and that, as I say, he really believed that we are only ever the richer for wanting to build connectivity. So yes, I've never thought of, I've never liked music that's made as if, you know, what's on stage should be um, treated with, you know, under just, just perfect respect because it's, it's high art. Because I think, no, that, that, that defeats the purpose of, of wanting to be, be human and alive and you might as well just film it, you know, then it's done and it's, it's sacred. But what is the whole point of live music is it changes on the day. So, I, you know, I, the most amazing concert I've ever been to was we just had Rosh Hashanah, Jewish New Year. It was the eve of Rosh Hashanah, so the day before the New Year in Jerusalem. And it was a concert of the Jerusalem Chamber Music Festival, which is special because what they do is rather than having like established ensembles, they have different instrumentals who join in like sort of bespoke arrangements just for that festival. And like I'm sure every day of that festival was amazing, but there was something on that last day, this energy in the room, that somehow just everyone feeling that sort of expectation and excitement towards the New Year, the music was, it was transcended in a way I've never experienced because the whole room was affecting and affected simultaneously. And it was the most remarkable thing because everyone had ordered but no one stayed for an encore because everyone had to get home to cook for the meal before, you know, Jerusalem, there's a siren that tells you everything stops. So, and that was a sort of weird proof that yes, as much as they were affected, life had to continue, but there was, 
everyone was just on a, walking out in this, in this space. So no, I think that's, as I say, of course the listeners have to be involved and every component of the music making should be involved in the collectivity for it to sort of justify its lived existence. And um, you have an installation that is, is sort of um, seeking to help us you know, walk through that idea, I guess, or recognize that idea, and now you have a thesis that uh, will hopefully be read by many, or you just, just about have a thesis that will be read by many. Um, is there a way of sort of, of boiling down the message both the thesis and the installation seek to convey um, to a really pithy kind of takeaway, or, or is the beauty of this project in its complexity of thought? Um, I think, there's a tapestry to the work. Um, you know, you mentioned my memoir, and I use that word in the in the preface to my memoir. I was was a tapestry as well because maybe that's just how my brain works. I'm not very good at thinking of things like in a very bad at traditional story writing. You know, the three parts that just you know happen and the story gets to a conclusion. I like these idea of things that sort of weave in and out of each other and, and look at the influences um, and sort of things that emerge. I like these idea of emergent properties. So I think the exhibition is and is. is a tapestry in its own right. The thesis is a tapestry in its own right. But my masters that Anna referenced was um, used Kabbalah as one of its models. The Jewish mysticism is one of its models. And Kabbalah specifically says that sort of the aim of everything should be beauty. And beauty didn't mean like aesthetic beauty. It meant this sort of idea of basically of balancing judgment and loving kindness. That that's what the whole world should be balanced by. And I would say that that's something, you know, why did I want this exhibition, why did I want it? It's because I love this idea of, yes, creating a sort of a way of having something that's quite, and it is, it's beautiful, Maggie's work is very beautiful, and peaceful, and sort of, you know, something that one is kind of, it's like a moment, that's what I've always wanted, I suppose that's what I would try to say, yes, it's complex, but it's a moment in which one can just engage, and I think that was the aim of the exhibition, is here is a moment that you can just engage and look at these beautiful images, just this beautiful cease, it's a woman in water, it's very peaceful, and that's I suppose is what I would like to take away. And I think if that's what life could be about, you know, we pursue those moments of beauty. As I say, but beauty and a balancing of loving kindness and judgment, not beauty as an aesthetics. Well, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> so. um, in a moment, we're going to be asking the audience for some questions. So if you have questions on the boil, um, now is a good time to start formulating them. Um, I am, I'm going to ask you one last question, Nikki. Um, and um, I, I, we've mentioned your memoir a couple of times. I, I've read your memoir, and this question is, it comes from my curiosity as the Associate Dean of Research Education. Um, what's scarier, writing a memoir or writing a PhD? Um, well, the difference in the, definitely in the PhD is the deadline. I have to say that. The thing with a memoir, I've actually enjoyed, I wrote this actually, wrote through something today, basically saying this exact thing. If I take away the stress, the PhD has been a really amazing experience because it has been an evolution of ideas over four years. The work is completely different to where it started, partly because we weren't initially working together and it had a very different sort of basis, and then since we started working together and where we've taken it, and every time we work on it, it gets closer to what I would really love it to be, if that makes sense, and I'm more excited by it. And I think that's been the almost disappointment that has to come to an end because I think that's sort of, I feel like on the cut, where it's cusp of something that's getting I say really much closer to what I would have loved to do almost from the outset that didn't have the tools or knowledge or techniques to do. So in some ways that's the difference. And a memoir didn't have that limit, didn't have that time frame. It had the freedom to do it in you know as long or short as I wanted it. So it was less scary in that regard. But it's also less satisfying in some ways because it's done solo in, in private. And I, I you know I'm proud of what I did there. But there's something that I really enjoyed, and I think it's you know same with the exhibition and the same with the, I've enjoyed the dialogues we've had, but you know, working with Maggie, working with yourself, that I think if I compare the experiences in terms of rather than of fear, in terms of what's more enriching, as I say, I'm bloody petrified at the moment about the PhD because we're on the cusp of what's the very scary part. But I think if I look back, as much as yet yeah, there's been a lot of stress, it's been a very, very enriching experience. Um, and something where, yes, like you almost look at the memoir afterwards, you go, well now I have a whole different memoir to write now because you know everything I had thought then has had an hour of the four years of sort of iteration at the other side, and I'd love to write the, you know, the response to the memoir since the PhD, if that makes sense. <laughs> um, well, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Vicky and Maggie, for sharing those initial thoughts. I'm wondering, are, are there any thoughts from the audience or questions from the audience before you? I was wondering, it's for Maggie, what part did color play in your 
your choices? Okay, well, colour, there were sort of two variations I was looking at in colour uh, in the initial stages. Um, there was the blue, the wash through the water, because I just wanted to create, the water is, it's kind of, in my mind, it was symbolic of like consciousness, you know, because I really wanted it to be peaceful um, where these ideas could exist without any real distractions or anything like that and make it all about the figure and the line work. So the blue was just like this, I guess, soothing, cooling effect that I had in my mind. Um, and then I had this other version where I was using just like an abstract spray of neons through the images, um, which was intended to like imply energy lines and movement and create like a flow, like a dynamic sense through um, the went through the water and to that sort of thing. Um, so yes, so I, we ended up going with the blue to create that sense of peace. I guess was yeah for you yeah yeah. So that's it. <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, one for Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> Use your up more. <laughs> So, in, at what point in the artist-client relationship does artistic integrity put up its hand and say, "Stop, no more"? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I haven't ever really had to put up my hand and say, "Stop, no more." I mean, yeah, no one's really challenged me that far. <laughs> and uh, Nikki, like she said, she gave me a lot of creative freedom with this, so. Um, I didn't ever really have to put up my hand and say stop no more. But I guess, I mean, if as an artist, if things just went to areas I wasn't comfortable with or if I thought it was going to be a detriment to the, the piece um, or, you know, uh, um, like the public, publicization, that, that's a word, of the work wasn't going to fit within our agreement, that sort of thing, then I'd put up my hand and say, no, this isn't going to work. Um, or if it was like offensive, um, you know, racist all that sort of thing, um, then obviously I would say, no, I'm not doing that, you know. Got to have boundaries, right? Boundaries. Got to be proud of the work that you put out, so. And I'm proud of this, so it's a winner. <laughs> I might just ask a follow-up question to Maggie. Is there an image that you feel, um, like, came out the best, or that's, that's your, your proudest of in this collection? In this collection? We yeah. were just talking about that before. Um, yeah. I think my, well, I, I really like Unity. Um, I really like the flow and the energy in that one, um, but I also really like bodies where she's just floating on the surface of the water. Um, I'm quite proud of that one. Um, <laughs> and uh, I think it's Descartes. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and the tree, trees in Genesis, I'm also a bit of a fan of that one too. So, yeah. <laughs> so keep an eye out for those. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I might stand up so you can hear it. Um, so, as a co-creative duo, I thought you both might be interested in this. Um, um, shall I use the mushroom? Sure. Just, yeah, all right, just thank you. I'll start again. Um, as a co-creative duo, I thought you, you both might be interested in this. I discovered a work by Megan Cope on the program Artworks, whose research engages in art, culture and science. I'm wondering what broader interdisciplinary areas might we next contemplate in exploring? <laughs> the reality of the arts world, it depends who's funding us. That's the sad thing, and I'm very, very, very grateful to the University of Sydney for the funding for this exhibition. It would not have been possible without it. Um, the previous two things we did were through funds through the Jewish Museum. So, I mean, only, you know, I would love to do anything. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> whoever wants to fund us, we would love to keep working together. But yeah, that's unfortunately the reality in the arts is it comes down to budget. Um, it comes down to, you know, how far you can stretch something. And, um, you know, if we're talking about the exhibition design, the space fits 10 images. So this, that's part of the thing that, you know, the sort of things we don't really talk about in this sort of space is I had to say to Maggie, okay, we need it to be 10 images. What can we do? How can we achieve 10 images? This is what the scholarships can cover and things like that. And it's the reality of collaboration that, as I say, I don't think a lot of people always think about. But um, it's important and it keeps things real. And it, it's exciting as well because, you know, you, it's kind of what Maggie said, you've got boundaries. You've very got much got limits. 
And then it's about how you stretch beyond those limits. Um, so like the first book, Maggie and I did, we could only have very small illustrations. That was cool. So I said to her that when I was a kid, I lived in America when Harry Potter was coming out. I had a version of Harry Potter almost no one in Australia had seen, which had these little figures. Chris may remember it. At the beginning of each chapter, these little figures. So I sent Maggie these things to say, she'd never seen them. I'm like, this, this has been in my head since like the seventh. Can you replicate this sort of thing? And that was, so as I say, that's where we use the limitations that have been imposed on us to create something, which is quite exciting. Yes? Um, just a question. Well, Exciting because as I said, we paired the images, Mikey and I, they're the five things and the five figures. And they sort of had their relationships. And I think it's like something to say was always designed into the but there's something so exciting about when I actually saw them and realized the way she created them, and especially even not across the themes but across the set. Spinoza and Descartes have been set up to look similar but distinct. So you know, the idea that yes, they were working in a very similar time with quite a similar philosophy, but they have quite a fundamentally different position. And, as you'll see in the exhibition, all the difference is, is Descartes looking down and Spinoza's looking up. And I think that was always so exciting because then I got the images from Maggie and like, that's it, she's captured what I'm trying to say, which is how similar yet how different these things are. And it does, it inspired me and they're the frontispiece of my thesis. And it's something that's been so lovely to return to. And if every time you kind of get scared, like, what am I doing again? What am I trying to say? Which is a very calming and reassuring that someone else has understood the gist of what you're trying to do. Yes, it's, um, it has been challenging to translate a PhD. Um, it's all these theoretical com concepts that were so unfamiliar to me. You know, um, but definitely rewarding and just, just opens my eyes. There's a whole academic world out there that could be illustrated now. <laughs> Look me up. <laughs> well, and it certainly made me think about, you know, what. Um, I, I love the idea of illustrating a PhD, actually. I think it adds um, an incredible layer of depth to these already very dense works, in a way. In a way. Uh, but depth that is somehow also illuminating, which I guess is uh, you know, one of those paradoxes that your thesis seeks to grapple with. Um, that's um, probably a great place for us to start making our transition over to taking in the exhibition. So please join me in thanking Nikki and Maggie again, and um, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer questions as as we build out in this reception. So thanks to both.